Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm from Vancouver. The first thing that comes to mind when I hear the word refugee is welcome. Welcome. Sanctuary. Let them in. Well, I think it's good. I can put in one word. It's more complex than that. The word would be help. Help. I think of the word sympathy. Suffering. Hardship. Cultural diversity. People who need a home. People who are suffering, uh, who are suffering in a, in a very bad situation, and I think it's nice that Canada can help out. I think there is not enough money to support them. I think a trouble. The unknown. Where are they going to put them? Are we able to, um, to accept them without any problems? When I hear the word refugee, I think of women and children, the innocent people that are trying to escape war-torn countries. My heart goes out to them because I, I know what it's like to have children and want them to be safe and secure and happy. Friends of ours who came over here on the Vietnamese crew about 25 or 30 years ago. They are in need of our help. They are poor people and they have a right to live happily. And that's all. So, lots of different answers there to a pretty simple question. What comes to mind when you hear the word refugee? We also asked you for your questions, and you had many. Most of them not so simple, so we've assembled four special guests who have the answers, or at least we hope they do. Ratna Omnivar is the chair of Lifeline Syria. Mike Malloy coordinated Canada's effort to bring the Vietnamese boat people to Canada in the late 70s and early 80s. Meb Rashid is the co-founder of Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care. And Louisa Taylor is a former journalist who focuses on immigrant and refugee health. So let's get to the concerns you sent us, starting with this one. And it comes from Shirley Gervais. And Mike, I'm going to ask you to handle. How is it possible to properly vet thousands of Syrian refugees in just six weeks? And is it also true that the vetting process will not be completed when the refugees land on Canadian soil? Let's take the second one first. Will it be completed? It will be completed. Uh, that was the big decision made o over the weekend. They've decided that they will take a little bit more time and no one will arrive without having been vetted for both health and security. And how is it possible to do that quickly? By putting a lot of people on the job. We've got the largest team ever assembled to do this kind of work, 500 people out there. That's what it takes to move that many people through the system that quickly. So there's 500 people at the various refugee camps uh, the, in, that are in Beirut, in Amman, and, and someplace in Turkey. And their job is to make sure that the people who come here have been properly processed, properly screened, properly vetted, we, and their identifications are secure. To take biometrics so we, we can uh, be sure of the identity all the way through the chain. Um, and the one thing I would say is it's, a, it's, it's not only a very big team, it's a really professional team with lots of lots of experience in this sort of thing. All right. Next question. This one comes from Alison Murray. And uh, Louisa, why don't we ask you to handle this one? Will the refugees brought over by the government become available to private sponsorship groups once they've arrived? Our understanding is that a lot of them will already be assigned to private sponsorship groups. That will have happened already. For the ones who are government-assisted refugees, uh, what we understand is happening is that they don't have the same circle of support that privately sponsored refugees do. So in different communities, there are cropping up this desire to have create those circles of support and work with settlement agencies to be, kind of create host programs or buddy systems to, to give them that support. All right. Well, uh, Louise has given us a hint at the differences between the two groups, between uh, uh, the privately sponsored ones and the government sponsored refugees. Ratna, help us with more on the differences. Government assisted refugees are selected and settled in Canada by government. The government takes responsibility for their arrival, their housing, their, their settlement, and it works with a range of settlement organizations primarily to do that. Privately sponsored refugees are selected and settled in Canada with all the due processes of government, but they're settled in Canada by private sponsors, which means groups of people get together, they raise the money to house them, 
uh, to provide them with all the necessities of life to ensure that their children are registered in school, that they have bank uh, uh, accounts, that they file for their social insurance numbers. It's a small team of people that wrap themselves around the family to make sure that they are successful in that first year. Meb, what about healthcare services and the differences between the two groups? Yeah, so historically, uh, both groups had the same health insurance coverage. Uh, but because of federal cuts to health insurance in 2012, now their coverage differs. So both groups will get provincial health insurance upon arrival, and they're also covered by a federal program called the Interim Federal Health Program. Uh, historically, the Interim Federal Health Program has been useful for what the government calls supplemental services services. Um, and some of these are very important. This is access to medication, uh, counseling, prosthetics for people who have had amputations, emergency dental and vision care. As of 2012, privately sponsored refugees no longer have access to those supplemental benefits, which is quite problematic. This government has committed themselves to restoring the coverage, but as of today, it hasn't happened. And we certainly hope this will happen over the next few days before we see the surge of Syrian refugees. All right. Next question, Mike, it's for you again from Peter Hooker. If problem people are identified, what will happen to them? Surely the country that shipped them here will refuse to accept them back. Does this mean that we will be stuck with them forever? Okay, well, the name of the game is to make sure problem people don't get here. And uh, if, if, if they're identified in the process overseas, they will be sidetracked. They will not be coming here. If a few do years down the road, uh, something pops up, one well, the Canadian criminal justice system will look after them. And even though they're protected as, as, uh, as convention refugees, which, which prevents arbitrarily sending the ba them back to the, the place where they, uh, they face persecution, the convention doesn't cover really serious criminality and, and, and for example, like things like text, terrorism. So I think our system will be able to cope with it. And I, but I'd be very surprised if anything gets through the net we have overseas. So the net is overseas. The net is overseas. Exactly. Okay. Um, this is a tweet, and Ratna, why don't you help us with this one? It's from Emmanuel Goffey, and it's kind of related in a way. Yeah. Can someone assure that 100%, or can they assure 100% that there are no risks linked to the welcoming of these people? No system is 100% fail safe, so I would be foolish to say it's 100% fail safe. But what we can take some confidence from is the, the, is the maturity of our systems, as Mike has pointed out, but also from our long history. We've, we've done this for years, and we've done this well, and we have been afraid before. We were afraid when the Hungarians came. We thought we were letting commies into our midst. The same with the Chileans, the same with the Indo-Chinese. And after all of that, I was just talking to Mike, of the 60,000 Indo-Chinese mm. who came, maybe there was one war criminal. We also have a history of social mobility. We have a refugee who's a minister in our cabinet today. That sort of tells people that this is a country where they, they, they can come, survive and thrive. All right. Meb, here's one from uh, Kimberly Smith. Could refugees be bringing diseases which we have eradicated here in Canada? Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting question. I, I think it's important to recognize that we have tens of millions of people coming through Canada each year as tourists. We accept uh, you know, somewhere near 250,000 immigrants here. Um, we have this adage uh, now in medicine where we say there's no such thing as a local disease, that we're 24 hours removed from any disease in the world. And in our medical training, we're hearing about things like schistosomiasis and malaria, diseases that are endemic in other parts of the world. Saying that, with the Syrian refugees, we're not expecting much in terms of infectious diseases. What about immunization? Because I, I imagine many of these people don't have their records. Yeah. Uh, how, how are you going to know about that? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, um, you know, that one's quite clear. If someone arrives here without their immigration records, and that's certainly true for most adults, uh, we start with a full primary series, assuming they haven't had vaccination in the past. There's very little harm from over-vaccinating. Uh, so, you know, it's very rare someone leaves uh, any appointment in our clinic not holding their arm. We give a lot of vaccination. So no matter what they say... If they don't have the records, yeah, you will assume right. we, they have nothing. That's right. We honor records when they have them in most cases, but as you mentioned, most adults don't, and then we just start from scratch. All right. Louisa, uh, you can start us on this one. Ishmael van der Rassel writes, does the government have plans to ensure these refugees find jobs, housing, and health care right away? Let's start with housing. 
I think it's important to know that it's not all up to the government. We have a very established, mature, successful settlement sector. So there are agencies that are already helping refugees find housing, for example. And in Ottawa, where I live, um, our organization, Refugee 613, has a task force that has settlement agencies, uh, private landlords, uh, co-ops, housing advocates, the city, we're all putting our minds to where people can be accommodated. And because a lot of them are going to be privately sponsored refugees, those, those groups, are uh, their settlement, their sponsorship groups, are going to help them find housing. What about jobs, Rana? The same as Louisa said, there is a very healthy, mature sector uh, all across Canada helping immigrants, refugees and other Canadians find jobs. It will kick in for Syrian refugees as well. But I think I want to point out that in all our research around uh, employment, we know that social capital matters. Who, who you know matters a great deal. Again, private sponsors bring that extra little bit. I have a family arriving. We've already lined up four or five leads for the head of the family who's a tradesman. So all kinds of support available. All right. Uh, briefly, Meb, you know, we, we keep hearing that the refugees are actually in excellent physical health. Is that what we are assuming we're going to be dealing with when they arrive? Yeah, so, I mean, we have to remember there's a bit of a selection bias with refugees. I mean, they have to get over the mountain and climb through the river. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes it's very hard for people who are infirm to make that journey. Um, what we're hearing about the Syrians, and there isn't a lot of literature, uh, very little in terms of infectious disease. I think it's important to recognize there was a very evolved healthcare system until five years ago, uh, after which it disappeared because of the civil war. So we're not expecting anything any different from what we see in other refugee populations. We expect a lot of chronic disease in this group, uh, perhaps a lot of chronic disease that has been unattended for a few years. Uh, we expect children who haven't had uh, well child visits, haven't been immunized. Uh, we expect to see some war-related trauma, unfortunately, uh, amputations, shra shrapnel injuries, uh, and then some mental health issues like post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, which is not uncommon in refugee populations given what they've endured. So there, there are a number of issues. Though. There are issues, but, you know, uh, refugees generally tend to be young. Um, and, you know, most of those issues can be dealt with quite early in the migration process. I mean, my sense is that uh, what they really need is good primary care. Uh, they need to connect with a family physician or nurse practitioner early in the migration process so we can tackle these issues early and make sure that they, um, they do acclimatize well. Okay. I've only got a minute left here before I've got to take a quick break, but Mike, help me on this. Why, uh, this comes from Clarence McKay. Why are the refugees so determined to come to Canada? U.S., Europe, but not to other Arab states, such as Saudi, Arabia, Qatar, UAE, and so on. There's no diplomatic answer to that one. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the reality is that since the Second World War, the countries that have opened their hearts and minds to refugees have been those very ones you named, the Europeans, ourselves, Australia, the states. Uh, in the Arab world, they... They just haven't do it, done this. They provide vast amounts of money for the Palestinians and other refugee situations, but they don't necessarily reach out in, in emergency situations like this. And, uh, I mean, my feeling is they're, they're missing out on, on, a, on a, an enormous amount of good human capital. As has been mentioned here, Syria was a pretty highly developed country. Uh, free university education, solid primary education system, good health care system. Uh, a strong sense of, 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 of public service in, in that society before it fell apart. Um, so I think we're actually, you know, we're the ones that are going to benefit. And when we look back on this 10 years from now, we're all going to be very impressed with the additional human capital that we got by opening our doors and hearts at this stage. All right, got to take that quick break I was talking about. But when we return, we'll have this question. Will the refugees who come to Canada get fast-tracked to Canadian citizenship? And welcome back to our national conversation on your questions about refugees. With us, Ratna Omidvar, Meb Rashid, Louisa Taylor, and Mike Malloy. Let's get to the question from Adrian Anderson. Do refugees have a say when organizations are deciding where they're sent and expected to live their lives? Mike? Initially, when they're interviewed overseas, one of the things that we try and do is identify whether they have connections anywhere in Canada. And obvious, if, if they do, even if it's not a formal sponsorship, that's where we'll try and send them. But when they first 
uh, arrived, they, th we uh, deliberately spread them out across the country so that the impact of the 25,000 will be, will be mitigated. But remember, in Canada, under the Constitution, people can move, and we would expect that a couple of years from now, people will begin to move, but they won't move capriciously. They'll move from one place to another because they have a reason to do so, just like Canadians. All right, Rotten, help me with this one from Aaron Caden Hiltz. Will citizenship be granted? Will the process be fast-tracked? So the refugees who arrive will actually arrive as permanent residents. So they will, like other immigrants, wait for five years, file their papers, pay their fees, take the citizenship exam, and be sworn in. There's no fast-tracking. No different than anyone else. Right? No different. Each of you have been involved uh, quite a bit on this issue and past refugee issues as well. But on this one, we've heard a lot of different things over these uh, last couple of months, especially the last few weeks from Canadians. What, from what you're hearing, is it telling you about Canada and Canadians? Meb, first. I think it uh, has been a demonstration of the tremendous generosity of Canadians. Uh, I mean, in my world, uh, there isn't a day that goes by where I don't hear from a physician or a nurse or nurse practitioner who's contacted me to see how they can volunteer to help with this migration. And I think after many years of hearing refugees referred to as bogus and cheats and people here who are here um, really taking uh, resources away from Canadians, um, it feels like a much more optimistic time. And I think, um, you know, Canadians, uh, it's a big task, but I think Canadians are up to it. And we're going to look back and be very proud about what we've achieved and see some tremendous things uh, in terms of what uh, what the Syrian refugees have There been has to. been a lot of, you know, I mean, we've seen it in these questions we asked. There's a lot of hate talk, too, that, mm -hmm. that's come amidst all this. You know, the, the, we've stuck to the what we thought were the serious questions, but there's a lot of that as well. Louisa, what is it saying to you? I think it's fascinating that the hate talk is about 0.05%. We're hearing that Canadians at, at our core know where we came from as a nation, how we were built. And we know that that's part of building the future and that we're welcoming people who are going to be assets. And, you know, as, as we've said earlier, the Vietnamese, the Kosovars, the Hungarians have all helped build this country. And, uh, and so it's not just a case of us helping out uh, a society or a nation that is in distress. We have a tremendous opportunity to build here. Ratna? So I've been gobsmacked in this past year. Uh, it's almost as if a light switch went on and people found their compassion in ways that they had buried it. Uh, I cannot turn around without someone asking me how can I help and it's just not individuals, it's institutions, universities, colleges, local governments, provincial governments, uh, hospitals. It, it, it's, it's sort of we've grabbed onto this as a project for the nation to, uh, to own the podium with. And, and be very proud at the end. I sort of think that's the sentiment that swept over our nation. Mike, you get the last word. One of the groups we were really worried about uh, in the Indo-Chinese program were Hmong Hill tribesmen from the mountains of Laos who got caught in the war and who arrived in significant numbers in, in, the, in, the, in the Kitchener Waterloo area. The Hmong community in Kitchener Waterloo are selling spring rolls after church in all the Mennonite churches to raise money for Syrian refugees. The country's working. The, biz the business of making people, who, for, foreigners into us is working very well. All right. Thank you all. Thanks very much for this. Thank you. And thank you as well. We hope this has uh, helped a little bit in understanding what's happening with the refugees who are coming to Canada.